Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On today's show, I have a very special guest, a returning guest. His name is Phil Baker. His website is philsbaker.com. You can check him out there. Uh, he was on my show two years ago. We discussed a great book. I highly recommend that. I'll put a link to our discussion. That book was Faithful Witness, the Early Church's Theology of Martyrdom. And he's just come out with a new book. Today is September 9th. This was published on Amazon September 5th, 2023. And the new book, which I've read through, his title is The Final Abominable Temple. Uh, really interesting book. And Phil lives in Texas with his two children. He's also written another book, uh, New Wineskins and the Simple Words of Christ. And he also is a musician as well. So feel free to check out his stuff. But again, we're going to talk about his new book, The Final Abominable Temple. So Phil Baker, welcome back to the show. Man, brother, thank you so much for having me on. Love everything you're doing, brother. Oh, cool. I appreciate it. Thanks. I have kind of like an interesting suite of uh, genres and topics that may not uh, look together all at once. It's kind of like a Mandela or something odd like that, like a, a interesting mix. So there, hopefully everybody, somebody can find something interesting in my catalog, which I'm now over a thousand shows. I've actually done a lot wow. of shows. Yeah. So um, for people who may not have heard our last discussion, Phil, can you kind of do a little bit of background and then what led you up to writing this new book, The Final Abominable Temple? Yeah, for sure. You know, I got a, a classical Christian education, you could say, uh, going to Houston Baptist University, uh, double major in uh, Christianity and psychology. And then I got a uh, master's degree as well in religious education. Uh, but even in my time in in undergrad and seminary work, I wasn't really exposed to the earliest Christian writings, like the anti-Nicene writings, which are the writings before the Council of Nicaea. So the first, basically the first 300 years of the church, you know, we were introduced to some different heresies, uh, like the Marcion heresy and Manichaean stuff, but um, didn't really get into what the earliest Christians believed. It was almost as if Orthodox Christianity began with a with Augustine. And uh, I've kind of found that a lot of um, the Augustine doctrines, uh, those you could find with like uh, Tulip with uh, Calvin, um, actually some of, many of them were opposed to what the earliest Christians believed. So that really interests me. I, uh, I was fascinated by the way the early Christians like Justin Martyr would, ex or Aristides would explain the Christian faith, which uh, would often be done by explaining Jesus's ethics found in the Sermon on the Mount. Like that's how they would explain Christianity. Now they believed in creedal statements like Orthodox Christians do today, like Jesus being one with the Father, uh, you know, separate but one, you know, same God, different persons, the Holy Spirit, that kind of a thing, born of a Virgin Mary, suffered, died, rose again bodily and is coming to, uh, again, second coming to judge the living and the dead. Like those kind of creedal statements you can find all through their writings. But um, when you look at what it really means to live like a Christian, they would often turn to the ethics. And one of the earliest Christian documents outside of the Bible, if not the earliest Christian document outside of the Bible, is called the Didache, which is the Lord's teaching through the 12 apostles to the nations. And in it, you find right from the beginning that there are two ways, there are two roads, kind of like you would see in Matthew chapter 7. There's the broad road that leads to destruction and the narrow road that leads to life. And then they explain what the narrow road is, and it's very much... Sermon on the Mount stuff, like Matthew 5, uh, things, loving your enemies, things like that. Uh, now, this book is full of orthopraxy. Uh, it's not filled with a lot of doctrine until you get to the end. In the last chapter of the Didache, you find a summary-type statement of what the church believed uh, concerning eschatology, concerning the events surrounding the second coming of Jesus. And uh, if you don't mind, William, can I read a little yeah, bit from that do. chapter? Awesome. So, in the Didache spelled D I D A C H E. So that, uh, yes, sir. Word, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, this is in chapter 16. And you, you're going to hear Matthew 24 stuff. You're going to hear Matthew 25. You'll hear a little bit of 2 Thessalonians 2, perhaps a little 2 Thessalonians 1, maybe. So check this out. The authors write, Watch over your life. Do not let your lamps burn out, nor your waist be ungirded, but be ready, for you do not know when our Lord is coming. 
and gather together frequently, seeking what is necessary for your souls. For all your years of faith will count for nothing unless you are perfected in the last days. In the last days, false prophets and corruptors will multiply, and the sheep will turn into wolves, and love will be turned into hate. As lawlessness increases, men will hate and persecute and betray one another. And then the deceiver of the world will appear as a son of God and will do signs and wonders, and the earth will be delivered into his hands. He will commit abominations which have never been since the world began. Then all mankind will come to the fire of testing and many will fail and perish. Then the author continues to like really go into the second coming stuff and it's pulling, you know, basically verbatim from Matthew 24. Uh, so as I was reading that, this idea of apostasy happening with the sheep turning into wolves when the Antichrist, basically the lawless one, the deceiver of the world is on the scene. That made me think a lot about 2 Thessalonians 2, where Paul says, you know, brothers and re- brethren, in regard to uh, the coming of the Lord Jesus and our being gathered to him, don't let anyone deceive you for first Two things have to happen. Number one, this great apostasy, and then the man of lawlessness setting himself up in God's temple, declaring himself to be God. So those things have to happen first, at the very least. Now, every time Paul discusses this phrase, the temple of God, which is the theon naos, basically, so the the God's temple, every time he talks about God's temple or the, the temple of the Holy Spirit, he's always talking about Christians. And the reason for that is that uh, gospel writers such as John in chapter 2 of the gospel of John show Jesus calling himself the embodiment of God's temple. And then in John 14, Jesus says he's going to pour out his spirit on people, and uh, one just like him is going to take up residence in people. And so if he's the embodiment of God's temple, and then he puts his spirit into believers in Jesus, then we become the temple of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, that's the holy place or the most holy place. So like the holy of holies is the way that Paul uh, describes believers now. And so if he's doing it every single time that he talks about God's temple, talking about believers in Jesus, why would he suddenly change in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? So it seems like Paul is saying that there's this great apostasy going on in the church with the devil, basically through the Antichrist, trying to take possession of Christians. And as I continue to look through the early Christian writings, that really seems to be what they think is going to happen. And we can go through some of those if you want a little bit later. I do, just for clarification's sake, do think there's going to be a temple built. In fact, it's all ready to go. If people want to look at Chabad.org, C-H-A-B-A-D.org, do you see what like the most religious Jews believe is going to happen when their quote-unquote Messiah, Mashiach, comes on the scene? And uh, it's really interesting because a lot of it comes from passages in Zechariah or Isaiah, things that we have seen Jesus do, believers in Jesus would, would say he fulfilled in his first coming. They're looking for those things in the second coming. Uh, and uh, yeah. All right. So Kabbalah has all, yeah. the, all the ritual instruments, all of the things that are going to fill out the temple. Like they're rigorously mm-hmm. working it. They're trying to find the sign, sign of the red heifer. So there's all kinds of uh, things that these very observant Orthodox conservative Jews are doing, like to put everything in place to make it happen, right? That's absolutely right. In fact, uh, four or five red heifers, red heifers from uh, Texas were shipped literally a year ago, like in September of 22, were shipped over to Jerusalem, and they've been inspected. Basically, they're ready to be burnt, and uh, so the altar can be cleansed. Like, you have a, a massive uh, uh, menorah, basically, but the lampstand uh, for the temple. It's made of pure gold. It's out. You can, like, take pictures in front of it. I was actually in Jerusalem in uh, in June of this year, took a picture oh, wow. right in front of it. Yeah, they have all the garments for the priests. They have the Sanhedrin ready to go. Like, it's all ready to go. But 
I think Paul is saying, even though there will be a physical temple, the devil is actually coming after souls. He's coming after the elect. And I know there's pushback from Matthew 24 where people say, you know, Jesus says the elect can't be deceived, but I actually don't think that's what he's saying at all. And I think the New Testament and Old Testament both show that the elect absolutely can be deceived, but the elect have been given everything they need to not be deceived if they will work those things, if, if they will put those into practice. Right. And so like one of the interesting trait, you know, lines in your book is the concept of the temple mm. and how the temple changed from old to new Testament. Right. So when people talk of like the Christian view of the temple is much different than the pre advent of Christ version of the temple. Right. Absolutely. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the temple was first, <laughs> You know, in a sense, you can see the Old Testament writers pointing to Eden as being like a temple with uh, you have the earth and then Eden, then the garden. And then in the middle of the garden, you have the tree of life where Adam and Eve would like walk with the Lord in this in increasingly intimate area. So Solomon's temple gets set up like that. Now, I, I just skipped over the tabernacle, but I'm just trying to save some time. Solomon's sure. temple is is designed to take the reader's mind back into Eden. For instance, everything is overlaid with gold. When you walk into it, like as you walk into the doors of the temple, you see cherubim carved into it. Cherubim, as you enter, are carved into the walls. You have lots of ornate palm trees uh, carved into the walls. And then when you get to the curtain, you see, you know, cherubim carved on the curtain. Then you enter through the curtain into the holiest of holy places, and you have massive cherubim there. And all these things should take your mind to Eden, because after Adam and Eve were kicked out, you had uh, cherubim guarding the way to the tree of life, right? And so this should be taking people's mind back there. And there's something greater, though, that's promised after uh, that temple is destroyed, Solomon's temple is destroyed, then you have the Zerubbabel's temple, and this is in the uh, uh, 5th century BC, and, um, or, yeah, it's in the early 500s, basically, BC, when this temple is built, and uh, there's a promise from the book of Haggai, so this is when the people have already come back from exile in Babylon, they're back, in, and God says the glory of the, of the latter temple will be greater than Solomon's temple. But that's weird because the Ark of the Covenant is gone. So they can't actually do like the Day of Atonement from the second temple's uh, construction until the end. Like, even in Jesus' day, they couldn't actually perform the Day of Atonement. So there's something weird going on. And then you have, uh, in Zechariah, prophecies about a guy named the Branch that is a priest king, which is really weird. A priest king ruling on God's throne in the temple. And that's just strange. And yet, as Christians, we see this fulfilled in Jesus because he would be the embodiment of God's temple. He would literally be dwelling in our midst as a priest king. You can see those two ideas not just prophesied and talked about in uh, Zechariah chapter 6, but you also see it in Psalm 110. Psalm 110 is the most quoted psalm uh, by New Testament writers. And it's talking about how the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And then he says, and I've made you a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. We don't have time to go into all this stuff, but you see this Lord sending the Lord to reign forever and to be a priest forever. So he's a king priest forever, just like that Zechariah 6 prophecy. And... Um, that comes true in Jesus. And now since Jesus has fulfilled those prophecies, then he helps us enter through, as the writer of uh, Hebrews talks about in Hebrews 9 and Hebrews 10, we get to enter into the holiest place of the temple, because that's what Jesus did after he ascended, according to the writer of, uh, of Hebrews. And so we now have access into this temple also, which is interesting, but we become temples as well um, of the Holy Spirit. We become priests. 
All these promises got fulfilled in Jesus, and now as Jesus indwells uh, believers, now we get to take on those promises as well. It's not that we're becoming God or anything weird, New Agey or Mormonism. Like, you know, like It's not like that, but uh, the real presence of God does dwell in those who believe in him. So we don't necessarily have to have a physical temple built um, for these prophecies uh, in uh, Second Thessalonians and the abomination. Of we don't have to necessarily have those, have a physical temple built anymore because we are the temple. Um, but I do think that the devil is going to use a physical temple um, with his chosen vessel, um, the Antichrist, to convince the elect and by that, I mean Christians and um, Jews, because that's kind of, gosh, I hate to get into like technical stuff, but Paul in Romans 11 talks about, you know, Christians being the true um, Israel, you could say, with Jew, Jewish believers in, G in Jesus being the root of Israel, but Gentiles being grafted into that. So he calls us elect in one sense in Romans 11, but he also has this um, physical Israelites also being elect uh for the sake of the fathers, um, being like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he talks about them wanting to come in and God wanting to bring them in. And they have been, obviously, for 2,000 years. Jews have been believing in Jesus for 2,000 years, just not on a grand scale. There's this partial hardening. And so I think the devil knows that God wants to bring Jewish believers in. Um, and so he's going to come after both the church, both uh, believers in Jesus, and those who are looking for the Messiah. And uh, if he can convince the Jews particularly that um, these promises are now being fulfilled in his man, the Antichrist, then uh, they're going to be deceived. And if he can convince the Christians that now this Antichrist, he's destroying all the enemies of God, that would be a pretty strong deception for Christians as well. And one way he'll do that, uh, in my opinion, if you read the writings of Chris White, he's done a great job. He has a book called False Christ that is just incredible. And he talks about the wars of the Antichrist from Daniel chapter 11. And in those wars, the Antichrist really goes to war against Muslim countries that are around Israel. And he's just a, just destroying these Muslim countries. Now, Christians have been since 9-11 uh, convinced uh, to a strong degree, American Christians at least, that like, Muslims are the main enemy. And so, and, and like, you know, Obama's the Antichrist and he's Muslim. So, you know, that kind of thought process. So when Christians start, American Christians particularly, or Western Christians start seeing this man who can make war against him, he's just annihilating the quote unquote enemies of God, these Muslims. Like that's going to be pretty uh, appealing to many Christians who haven't totally read their Bible, um, that this guy is just, it seems like the second coming of Christ has happened because he's putting his enemies under his feet. Right. Right. Yeah. right. So there's a lot of deception going on and the Jews still pray for their Messiah today. Like I've talked to conservative Jews yep. and they're waiting for, I mean, that's like an integral part of the Judaism, mm -hmm. you know, 21st century Judaism is so. There's, I mean, the, st the stage is being set or the table is being set for these very incredible things, especially with this kind of notion of the temple, because yeah. the, the, this post Christ notion of the temple is not something that Jews believe in at all. Like right. this uh, kind of a dispersion of the temple to all of the believers, that kind of idea. It's very much a rigid kind of a temporal building, literally. That's it. And I mean, it's still some of these synagogues are called temples too. But, um, right. It is yeah. interesting. I mean, no, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was just going to talk about the Kabad stuff. But... Yeah, please do. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, like on the uh, Kabad.org website, there's this article that is, What is the Jewish belief about Mashiach? So, Messiah. And it's by a guy named Nissan uh, David Dubov, basically. And I'll just read a few uh, like lines from it. So, this is what the most religious Jews believe about Messiah. Any potential Mashiach, Messiah, must be a direct descendant of King David. So think Isaiah 9, like stuff we read about in um, <laughs> Christmas time, you know. Must be a direct descendant of King David, as well as an erudite in Torah learning. So he's also got to be just a master of the scriptures. If this individual actually succeeds in rebuilding the temple and gathering in the exile 
then he is the Mashiach. So that's straight from like Zechariah 2. According to some traditions, God himself will rebuild the third temple. According to others, it will be rebuilt by Mashiach. Still others suggest a combination of the two opinions. And if you, I'm just going to pause there. If you read Zechariah, there is like this weird, who is building the temple? Is it God or is it the Messiah or is it God through the Messiah or is God the Messiah? And one of the reasons is in Zechariah 2, it says the Lord will send the Lord to you. And that's weird. I will send him to you. And the him is the Lord. It's strange in Zechariah. And he's going to dwell in your midst. He's going to gather these um, exiles and he's going to rebuild the temple of the Lord. So it's interesting there. But um, yeah, it's uh, as you get into their stuff, you really find that um, Gosh, it makes you it makes you wonder how Christians should feel about a third temple being built. Right. You know, a lot of Christians are like trying to help this thing get built. There's a there's a uh, group called Bone Israel, B O N E H Israel. That's a Christian nonprofit that helped those five or four red heifers, five red heifers get brought to oh, Israel. Wow. So wow. it's like, what should we really be doing this? Because basically, we're we're convincing people, um, we're convincing Jews that the dude who builds this is God. That's just incredible. And, incredible. and what's the reason for that? Well, you know, those who bless Israel will be blessed. Those who curse Israel will be cursed. So we're trying to help them. Maybe that's one thought. Maybe the thought is, you know, Christians, we're going to be yanked out of here before the Antichrist comes. So that doesn't even matter to us. You know, it, it won't matter to us what happens after that because we're just trying to get Jesus back. So let's help this third temple re get rebuilt so that we can be gone. And then maybe you combine that also with some dispensational belief that um, all Israel will be saved, li literally all of them. So even if they're like partially deceived at first, God, even if they take the mark of the beast, you know, God's going to deliver them because all Israel will be saved. Man, those are some risky. I mean, you're, you're taking a huge risk of uh, being wrong, number one, for yourself, if you're a Christian, uh, about you being taken out before the antichrist and two like you're walking these people like sheep to the slaughter you know convincing them that this dude is god this dude is the messiah when you know better so like i'm really against christians helping uh this temple be built like in in my opinion like one of the most anti-Semitic things that a Christian can do is try to is, is help and encourage Jews to believe that the one who builds the temple of the Lord, the a physical temple, is the Messiah. Right. Like that okay, so supplants the Christian worldview that Jesus yeah. is the Son of God, right? So yeah. right. Like it is interesting. And they also they can turn on you like uh the some of the really super orthodox jews like if you say jesus is the messiah they can kill you because you're a blasphemer they can that's literally right. stone you so that's, that's right. like the new saying that's a potential of the new sanhedrin so right. it's almost going back to the first century where mm -hmm. a lot of these jews thought they were doing their religious duty duty by persecuting christians right that's absolutely right so yeah, you, you yeah, we'll come Paul. back again <laughs> I'm sorry, people dude. would never believe it they would never believe that that something like that could come back when it could it absolutely could. It did. You know, you're right. It happened with Paul, you know, when, or Saul, right? The guy who became Paul, known as Paul. But yeah, he thought he was fulfilling basically Deuteronomy 13, where if you have a person, even if he's doing miracles, leading the people to worship a false god, then you have a duty before God to not just kill that person, but everybody who's following him. So like Paul really believed like he's an he's an earnest guy. He's a sincere guy. Paul was not a hypocrite. Paul was totally sincere, living out his convictions. And I think that's one of the reasons why God chose him, because God is near to those is Psalm 145. God's near to those who call on him, who call on him in truth. So Paul was acting in sincerity when he was trying to persecute Christians based on the revelation that he had. Now, Again, that happened in the uh, early second century with a guy who became known as Simon Bar Kokhba. And I didn't talk about this in the book, but you had one of the biggest um, rabbis, the most po popular rabbis of the day, Rabbi Akiva, who gave this man the nickname Bar Kokhba, which is like son of the star, which goes back to an ancient uh, Old Testament prophecy about uh, this star. 
this man called the star basically uh being the messiah figure and uh right, so Bar Kokhba one, was a messiah figure he was some people yes. said he was the jewish messiah of that time 150 AD right yeah he he actually was absolutely was called that by his people and one of the things that he did if you read uh uh Justin Martyr's first apology he talks about how Bar Kokhba uh found any like Jewish believer that was a Jewish believer in Jesus and he would have them killed basically because you're right they were considered idolaters and uh, so this happened and it happened again and it will happen again because you were citing some of the Noahide laws and that first and second Noahide law has to do with worshiping God as one you worship the one God and you don't have any idols so it's like the first and second of the Ten Commandments uh, put in the Noahide laws. And you're absolutely right. Someone who's saying Jesus is Lord would be considered an idolater. And they don't have to have a trial for you. They can take you right out and kill you just like they did. Well, Stephen. they had a trial for Stephen, you know, in, in a way, but they just executed him, you know. And what was one of the main things that he was talking about? He quoted uh, uh, Isaiah 66, where he said, God does not dwell in temples or houses made by hands. Like you thought there was a place you could, God isn't about that now. God is uh, in the person of Jesus and now in us. So Stephen went right after the temple in a sense, and he was accused of speaking words against the temple, just like Jesus was. And if you're really claiming Jesus is the temple, if you're really claiming he's God and the New Testament is true, we will be treated like Stephen and Jesus. Right. And I mean, that's the important theme of your book, too, is this whole dispute of what the temple is, different views of the temple, because it's happening right now in the world like the yep. and the Israel Israel's growing in power and uh, still, uh, you know, wants to fulfill this prophecy, prophecy. Right. But you also write in the book, I think they said uh, Christ confused the Sanhedrin or some of the temple priests by saying, I will destroy this temple and rise it, raise it in three days. Nobody knew what he meant, not even his followers. Right. But that's like referencing himself as the temple, as that's a right. temple. And then when he died on the cross, the uh, like you mentioned, like the, the setup of the interior part of the temple, all of the veils ripped from top to bottom. Right. That's right. So Like incredible things happened. Yeah, absolutely. And the Bar Kokhba you mentioned, right, that facilitated the second Roman annihilation <laughs> of uh, of Israel, too. Right. That led to that. Yep. Absolutely. And and then you see a lot of the Jewish guys going, oh, no, 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 no. We we didn't think he was the Messiah. But yeah, they were very much uh, all about Bar Kokhba at, at first. He was very zealous for the law. He was trying to live out the Jewish commands, even without the temple being there. You know, Jerusalem was still standing, but uh, yeah, the temple wasn't. Temple wasn't. Like it was almost raised to the ground. They were in the process of rebuilding. And then mm -hmm. I think it was Hadrian, right? Hadrian facilitated that. Uh, second or made sure the second revolt was put down in 150 and Bar Kokhba was out. And there is like this whole uh, strain within Jewish law of the false messiahs. There's like a bunch of false messiahs that have popped up because they're still looking for them, right? So that's right. Uh, so it is, it is an interesting, th another interesting theme that's woven through your book too is like, what's the real messiah? Obviously, to, it's it, from a Christian perspective, it's Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth right? That's right. That's right. And I mean, they're driving throughout Israel in, in uh, June because uh, we were taking our own car, me and a couple of uh, friends, my wife. Um, there were signs all through the Galilee. So like the northern area close to, to Lebanon and Syria, there, there are signs all over the road. And uh, more and more and more as you get closer to Jerusalem of this, I don't remember the dude's name. But this Messiah, they, they, they think he's a Messiah figure, right? And uh, they're passing out cards, uh, like little tracks about this guy. And uh, But, you know, was it, a, was it Schneerson? Was the guy who died? Man, I don't somebody remember. somebody who's alive? I don't remember. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Right. Interesting. Yeah. But, the, you know, there's another guy right now that's, um, gosh, I don't, Shlomo something. I don't remember his name, but uh, he's a Yaku, Yakuna uh, rabbi. So this guy is considered like a rabbi of rabbis. He's a young guy and he's, he's in his early thirties. There are videos on YouTube about him, uh, performing all these different miracles for people. Right. Oh. And so, yeah, yeah. Healings, all these kinds of prophesying over people. Yeah. There's a lot of messianic fervor going on right now. 
and things wow. could pop off because they're, they are ready to go. Um, I don't think it's going to be someone like Trump. Um, I don't think it could be a Gentile at all. I think uh, according to their beliefs, the Jews' beliefs, and according to early Christian beliefs, this guy has to be a Jew. He has to be from the circumcision. And I know that can take us to, to places where we're like thinking, uh, are we being anti-Semitic? And I don't think we, I don't, I'm not thinking that they are. I think, the, like I said, the devil and the Antichrist are like the most anti-Semitic beings that there are. And we need to try to preach the gospel to Jewish people uh, because their real Messiah has come. And, and I think Paul shows that they can believe in Messiah and they are. More Jews are believing in Jesus now. So like, I think, I'm sorry, you had something up you wanted to show people? Well, I think, is this the guy you're mentioning, Shlomo Yehuda Be'eri? Exactly. Yeah, I think so. So, like, so this yeah, is like two young years guy. ago. Yep. And the title says, Christians anoint young rabbi as false messiah. Misunderstanding by end times prophecy watchers leads many to believe that the tribulation is at hand, Israel today. Just so yeah. interesting. So, yeah, it's, people are talking about it. Yeah. There's what, at the Wailing Wall, all this stuff. It's really incredible. I mean, it's incredible. It's, and to, I don't think it's anti Semitic just to ask questions and look into these things because this phenomenon, these religious changes are you know, fermenting like right in front of your face. It's like incredible. That's right. You know? And the Jews returned to Israel. So that's like almost a, like a biblical event in itself. Right? That's I right. Take back to Jerusalem, I should say. Mm -hmm. Um. So, so you talk about the temple, the desolation, and then uh, you kind of go into like, the, there's also a theme with the temple and just the, the Old Testament and New Testament about apostasy, right? Like, mm -hmm. are we in an apostatized age? And mm. is, is anybody really that, I mean, it seems like that was a common theme in the Old Testament was being close to following uh, God's laws and rules and then people falling away and then coming back and all this stuff. So yeah, where are we today? Yeah, you know, I think we are very close to the end. I mean, I'm not going to be a date setter, but I think things are, are definitely ready to pop off. Uh, you can see just if, if you were only looking at at the world through uh american christianity eyes i mean you'd be like well we're already apostate i mean the oh, goodness the church has just gone buck wild uh in in the west now in persecuted areas like iran the church is just going in, in an incredible like, like explosion in terms of the purity of uh, followers of jesus china different places like that yeah, india um, too a lot yeah. of christians Absolutely. Absolutely. But in the West, I mean, it just looks terrible. But you're right. Like throughout throughout time, whenever you see a temple, there's going to be uh, a temple of, of the Lord. In a sense, there's going to be uh, an abomination happen. And uh, by that, it's like the worship of anything other than God. That's a that's considered something that's abominable. Uh, and then also you're going to see an apostasy happen. You saw it uh, with uh early with Satan, right? I mean, he's like with God's heavenly temple originally, and, and there's this uh, abomination, and we can see hints of that in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, where he wants to be worshipped. That's abominable. And then he apostatizes, apostatizes, he rebels. You see it with Adam and Eve. They choose to follow the directives of the serpent, the Nakash, you know, the devil, uh, and so that's false worship. That's abominable. And then they also defect. You know, they, they give their allegiance, in a sense, to, to Satan. Now, God's very gracious with them because they're the original couple, I think. And so he's like, bless you guys. I'm going to bring you back. But they still committed that act. And then you see it with Solomon's temple, for sure. You see it with Solomon. It's really interesting in Revelation 13 how he says that the number of uh, the beast is 666. I believe the only time, um, the main time that you see that number, 666 in the Old Testament, it's attributed to one person, and it's to Solomon, which is really sure. interesting. He brings in 666 uh, talents of gold from the nations every year. And now what happens with Solomon? Well, if you read in Deuteronomy, I think it's 17, there's a list of all the things that a king should not do. And immediately when Solomon becomes king, he starts doing all those things that you're not supposed to do. And God promised him, you know, like if, if you're faithful to me and you walk in my ways, like you're going to 
you're you're going to be the dude in a sense and this kingdom is going to be one that won't pass away but if you don't i'm going to completely annihilate this place and make it a proverb and a byword to the nations they're gonna be like whoa why did god destroy his people like this in this this place well solomon immediately becomes an, an apostate in a sense like he starts i mean at first it's syncretism he's worshiping yahweh and Chemosh and Molech, and then it seems like he just goes head head on into it, and uh, full on worshiping these terrible uh, demon, you know, fallen angel based gods that are demanding child sacrifice, and I mean, just horrific things. He becomes a very uh, strong type of Antichrist, the false son of David, in a, in a sense, the evil version of the son of David. He has a kingdom that's at peace. Who can, who's, nobody's making war with Solomon. He's like the most powerful man on the earth. All the nations are bringing their wealth to him, and yet he's like leading the people into apostasy. And it just gets worse and worse. Um, I, I think Solomon repented at the end of his life. I think that's what Ecclesiastes is about. Um, but, you know, it's just a, he's a picture of, I think, what, what is coming. Right. And it's kind of plays out in the world today. Like you have all, I mean, the re-rise of the occult or occultism and modern culture uh, is really real. Like it's everywhere. It's in the films and on TV and music videos and all that stuff. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's I mean, interesting times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I know there's going to be pushback about whether Christians can actually apostatize. You know, uh, I grew up Southern Baptist, and so, you know, the once saved, always saved camp. But I don't think the Scriptures teach that. I think the Scriptures teach that there is security for the believer and not for the unbeliever, obviously. And I think Christians can move from a place of believer to unbeliever, uh, you know, the person, I don't know if people are familiar with Derek Webb, who was going around the world preaching and, and singing about the gospel with Cademan's call. You know, he's completely divorced himself from Jesus. And you see wow. someone like Joshua Harris, the guy who write, who wrote um, I Kiss Dating Goodbye. He became the head pastor of, uh, I think it's Covenant Life Ministries, Sovereign Grace Ministries. Like this guy was one of the biggest pastors in America and it started really early for him. Um, and then he wrote on his Instagram page uh, a couple of years ago, like, by all measurements for determining a Christian, I am not a Christian, you know. And yeah, you know, I was just talking to someone who was in his small group last week, uh, you know, a new friend of mine, and just wild stuff. And it's just so sad. But I think that goes to a passage like First Timothy 3, where Paul is giving instructions for putting in uh, new overseers. And he says, like, an overseer should not be a new convert, because they are at risk of becoming puffed up with pride and and incurring the condemnation of the devil. And that's a crazy passage right there. He's basically saying that an overseer could become puffed up with pride and fall away and have the same punishment as the devil. And we see the punishment of the devil in Revelation chapter 20 when he's thrown alive into the lake of fire. So like... Right. And there's another passage I, you mentioned in the book, I can't remember it offhand, but where Paul uh, hands over to the devil, Hymenaeus and uh, the other guy, right, too... So yeah. that's an that's open apostasy. Like mm -hmm. Paul is sending them into a terrible place. Like that's right. So that's another example of of apostasy. So you're not always saved, and you can lose the faith. And people, I think even in Revelation, I think or one of the events of Christ returning, he said like 500 have fallen asleep or something. People who would were believers at one point, but were not maybe as fervent, right? And definitely says that in the in the statements to the different churches like you know yeah you were lukewarm and mm -hmm. so i don't think that the status of a christian is really ever static it's not like you can i can speak from experience you're more attentive maybe get distracted and maybe less attentive to the faith and so it can happen to individuals and uh whole societies or towns or whatever i think in my opinion yeah, now, uh, you know, in in uh, First Timothy one, when he's talking about Hymenaeus and Alexander, he says he's turned them over to Satan to teach them not to blaspheme because they've suffered shipwreck in regards to the faith. In regard to the faith, now he turned a man. He con 
sorry, he instructed the Corinthian church to turn a man over to Satan in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. This man was having relations with his stepmother, and Paul told them to turn that man over to Satan. Now, in that situation, it's interesting because in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul tells them to bring that man back, to try to restore that guy which is interesting because he doesn't want that guy to be damned. So with 1 Timothy 1, Hymenaeus and Alexander, that he's turning over to Satan to teach them to not blaspheme, it seems like he's doing that because he wants them to be saved. And they need to experience basically shunning, like a life apart from the blessing of God in order to try to wake them up so that they can come back. So it seems like Paul has hope for people who have apostatized. Uh, that It seems like he, he not, not, not that he's saying they're fine, it just seems like he, he believes that the Holy Spirit can bring them back if the church is working with them. So, I, you know, if you know somebody that's apostatized, if you're thinking, don't see that as a final thing. Like, if you're feeling the prompting of the Holy Spirit, if you're feeling the conviction, follow that and come back. You know, we, but I, I do believe if we're in a state of unbelief, and that's not doubt. Unbelief, I think the way Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 11, is a rejection of Jesus, a uh, transfer of allegiance either to a different God or to no God. Um, so Paul says, like, actually, the Jews of Jesus's day did that. They rejected the promised seed of Abraham, which took them from a place of being in the faith to out of the faith. Now, but Paul says that God, they can be grafted back in. God can graft them back in if they will believe in Jesus. And so I think that's one of the reasons why he's going around at the synagogues. And you see people like Crispus, the synagogue leader in Corinth, believe. He becomes a believer, which is incredible. So this is a man who, you know, in Paul's uh, third missionary journey, I believe it's the third missionary journey, like he had... Christmas had rejected Jesus as Messiah. And yet, so he was like in Paul's mind, cut out of the faith, cut off from the faith. And yet, because he now put faith in Jesus, he's grafted into God's brought them back. And now he becomes part of the root in a sense of the church because he's a Jewish believer. So he has the Torah, he has the scriptures, he has all these things, which can help prove to for uh, new Gentiles, that these prophecies came true in Jesus. So like we need, in my opinion, we need Jews in the body of Christ. We need them because they have these passages like Zechariah 1, 2, 3, 6. They have these prophecies like on lock, like they're really good with these. And so they can actually do an incredible job uh, teaching Gentiles the Old Testament prophecies about Jesus's, like the Messiah's death and like That's what happened with Paul, right? He didn't believe in Jesus at first, and then he comes to know Jesus. And so this guy becomes just an amazing blessing to the church, showing them how all these prophecies came true in Jesus. Right. So you can be grafted in, is really your point, even if you're in a state of apostasy, yeah. maybe even unbelief yeah. or doubt. I mean, doubt, like doubt was in the uh, apostles, right? So yeah. Timothy, Timothy really need, or Thomas needed to really see things with his own eyes. He didn't have as much, uh, maybe as much faith as others did, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Ma Matthew 28, you know, the great commission 28, 18 in 16, I think it is 28, 16 or 17. I don't remember. It's like the verse or, or two right before the great commission. You have all these disciples and apostles of Jesus. They're in Galilee. They're seeing the, re like they believe in, the resurrected Lord, he's right there in front of him. And yet Matthew says, some doubted. It's right. not unbelief. You have people that have literally, they're literally looking at Jesus resurrected right. and yet they're still dealing with doubt. And that's okay. Doubt is okay. Like, honestly, like I struggle sometimes with believing in God's goodness for me. You know, is God really going to come through for me? But God can handle that stuff. You know, that's not going to get you kicked out. And bad deeds are not going to get you kicked out. It's a matter of belief or unbelief. We're saved by grace through faith. You know, so if faith is how we come in, unfaith would be how we get out. Not good deeds doesn't don't get us in and bad deeds don't get us out. It's not about works. Right, right. 
Well, there's a lot more in this book too. Like we've got the 45 minute mark, but like you go through at the very end, you ask questions, what's going on? What's, why is all this evil happening? Um, what's going on? Like apostasy occurring is God is good. It's like a classic questions. Why is God allowing this to happen? All that stuff like that. But uh, how do you want to wrap this up? Uh, Phil, like, I mean, I think that you've covered a lot of some of the themes, but there's a lot more in this book and also shows your interest in early first and second century Christianity. Like you've got a real good lock on that. Like if a lot of people forget, like some of these people who are writing in Ignatius or whatever, are followers of Polycarp were followers of John, right? Mm-hmm. Or was it Irenaeus, not Ignatius? Yeah, Irenaeus. John, uh, Ignatius was a follower of John as well. Okay. So like like people, there's a direct tie that a lot of people conveniently f- forget a lot of the uh, Christian naysayers uh, conveniently forget that that history really does exist. They, mm-hmm. they will deliberately. I know some by name off the top of my head that yeah. deliberately overlook all that actual real history. But uh yeah, if you can kind of, I mean, I just like if you'd like to just kind of wrap it up for us, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, just one word of exhortation like, we need to encourage one another daily, as long as it's still called today, so that none of us will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. I know there's so much craziness going on in the church, but I really think COVID was a blessing. I think these lockdowns were a blessing to the American church because it forced a lot of churches to turn towards small groups, turn toward these small little gatherings, because that showed us that we don't need the buildings. We don't need that stuff. We don't need the lights. We don't need cameras. We don't need microphones to do what God has called us to do. We can get things really simple, and we're going to need to be able to do that, I think, in the days to come. If you want to find any of my resources, you can go to philsbaker.com. You got a link to my podcast there. The podcast is called Reclaiming the Faith. I'm actually on Tuesday, uh, the, what is it? The uh, 12th, I guess. Tuesday, I'm going to drop a podcast of an episode that I think should have been in my book that I didn't realize a connection between 2 Thessalonians 2 and Zechariah 5. I didn't realize that until the day after I published the book, which is just really unfortunate. But uh, I'll probably eventually do an an updated version of the book. But until then, you can get um, a little taste of that chapter on Tuesday from Reclaiming the Faith. So yeah, man, thank you so much for having me on again, William. Again, man, I love what you do. I'm praying for you, man. And thank you. just God bless you, brother. God bless you as well. Thanks for coming back on. Again, the title of the book is The Final Abominable Temple. The author is Phil Baker, just published September 5th, 2023. And where's the best place to get it? Can they get it through your website or Amazon? You can get it through my Am- uh, website, Amazon. It's available in hardback, paperback, uh, audio, and digital formats pretty much anywhere you buy books. So you can get the audio book on Amazon as well. So mm-hmm. awesome. Thank you so much, Phil. Really appreciate it. Let's do that. Let's do that.